Hello, I'm Clev Mesador. Thank you for joining us for the Black Blockchain Summit. I am so thrilled to moderate this session, Our Economy, Life or Death. I lead the National Policy Network of Women of Color and Blockchain. Previously, I served in the Obama administration, worked in Congress, and even worked for CNN's Washington Bureau. I'm very excited that this fall, I'll be releasing my very first book, which talks about my quest for justice in politics and crypto. Now, we have a great conversation ahead for you. So today we're going to explore the economy, right? We'll look at the gaps within the traditional economy as well as the crypto economy, the emerging crypto economy. And when we talk about crypto, we always talk about financial inclusion. The guests I have with me today knows a lot about why we need to focus on financial inclusion. I'm joined by economist John Perkins. He is the author of a very interesting book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. It's a New York Times bestseller. It was a New York Times bestseller for 72 weeks. It has been translated into 72 languages. Oh, it has been translated into 37 languages, and it has sold more than 2 million copies. Now, John has also advised the World Bank, the United Nations, IMF, U.S. Treasury, Fortune 500s, and leaders of countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East. It's, it's an honor to have you join us today, John. Please share a bit more about you, why you're passionate about the global economy, and the contra controversial contributions you made. Well, thank you, Clay. It's wonderful to be with you, and, and it's, I really appreciate what this magnificent organization is doing to, to, to produce these programs. Uh, yeah, so, you know, my real title was uh, chief economist many years ago during the 70s. Uh, for 10 years, I was, but I was what we call an economic hitman. My job was to identify countries with resources our corporations wanted, like oil, arrange huge loans to that country. The money didn't actually go to the country. It went to our own corporations to make huge profits, building big infrastructure projects in those countries that benefited a few wealthy families, but didn't really help the majority of the people. And we can go into more detail if you want, but that's the summary version. Oh my God, so you really were a hitman, And you know firsthand the challenges our economy faces and why, you know, and, and those challenges are real, right? We know that globally around 1.7 billion people are unbanked, underbanked, or lack access to basic financial ser services. Now, this is an issue we're committed to addressing in the crypto economy, but there was a source to all this, right? This just didn't happen, you know, by coincidence. You often talk about how the business of business became to maximize short-term profits. And you point out to how that, you point to how that led to a deaf economy. Now, tell us more about this deaf economy theory that you have, and also some of the practical strategies to transform the failing global deaf economy into a regenerative life economy. Yes, well, <clears throat> unfortunately, the deaf economy is not just a theory, it's, 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 a, it's happened. And you know, it's a failing system, and we see that by climate change, and, you know, the oceans are rising, the glaciers are melting, the many species are going extinct, there's tremendous income inequality and racial inequality throughout the world. It truly is a, an economic system that's failing. It's killing itself. And, part, and to a large degree, it's based on this premise that you mentioned that its goal is always to maximize short-term profits, regardless of the social and environmental cost. That's the goal, and it's stated, it's taught in business schools, it's promoted by the World Bank, and it's, it's, it's a terrible goal when you come right down to it. And it's contrary to the way human beings have lived for most of our 200,000 uh, years that we've been human beings, where we've always looked at taking care of long-term interests for our children and our grandchildren and yeah. our great-grandchildren. But suddenly we find ourselves in this economic situation that's tearing itself apart, that's consuming itself into extinction. But the good news is it's based on that one goal, that, and that's just a perception. I talk in, in my latest book, which is called Touching the Jaguar, and I'm wearing a Jaguar here. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I talk, I talk about how our perceptions create our reality. 
And this perception of maximization of, of profits in the short term has created a reality that's failing us. And we need to turn that around and create what we call a life economy. How do we get to a life economy? Well, well, first of all, a life economy really is an economic system that, that pays people and pays investors to invest in things that will clean up pollution. Yes. You know, instead of paying companies to make weapons like Lockheed or, or some of these other companies, let's pay them to make equipment that will mine all the plastics and, and microplastics floating around in the oceans. Let's pay people to, to regenerate destroyed environments and to recycle and to create new technologies that, that get, go way beyond where we are today with solar and wind. Although we've made huge progress, let's make more progress. So we're really looking at an economic system that is regenerative, that's regenerative, excuse me, regenerative, that is itself a renewable resource. And again, it's, it's kind of the economic system that human beings have lived under most of our history. And indigenous people, like ones I, I often spend time with in the Amazon, uh, still kind of look, still live that way. So uh, we're not talking about going back to living in grass houses or caves. We're talking about a vital, wonderful economy that could be a full employment economy that could pay, that will pay people fair wages, living wages, and that will will reduce the income inequality gaps that we so badly suffer from today, and the racial inequality gaps. Yeah, and obviously these are pressing issues, and we live in a very unique time when. You know, whether you are a baby boomer or Gen X or like me or millennials and Zoomers, these issues are top of mind. You know, I think about, you know, the Zoomers, the young generation under 20. You know, I, you know, when I was when I think about climate change, I think of something that's going to happen after I die or the impact on the, the environment. For them who are 16, 18, this is going to impact their children, their grandchildren. So they're going to have to live this. And it sounds like you're talking about reinvesting in people and reinvesting in the, in the resources that matter to our society. Yes, well, yeah. And in fact, we're all experiencing those things today. I mean, these horrendous fires that we have in, in California and in the Amazon and in Australia and the hurricanes, you know, that, that are much stronger and more frequent as strong hurricanes than ever before. We're experiencing this very strongly now. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important message. And I think the good news, Clave, is that, that to, to make the change, all we have to do is change our perception from this goal of, of maximizing short-term profits and for individuals to maximize consumption, basically materialistic consumption, which is another aspect of that goal, and turn that around and say what we need to do is maximize long-term benefits for people and the planet, and, and to make that part of our lives and to realize that that's going to bring us great joy. And, and it just takes this change of perception. That's all. Of course, then it takes a lot of actions to make it happen. But I think this, this virus, this pandemic that we've ex been experiencing has taught us that we can change. We all had to make huge changes in our lives. And then we may not be too comfortable with some of them, particularly not at first, but becoming more comfortable with wearing masks, I think, and, and social yeah. distancing and not shaking hands and not hugging quite as much. As, but so we, we've seen that we can, we can, we can adjust, where we can be very adaptable. And so this yeah. has been a very strong message. It's also taught us the importance of this media that we're dealing with now. And that, again, is, it takes us into the, the whole idea of, of blockchain and so forth. So we're, 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 we're really moving in that direction already. Yeah. So, so let's shift to blockchain then, right? So I love how you talk about these issues and you talk about the fact that it all leads back to the economy, right? The, and when we look at blockchain, the, the, what, what prompted this creation of cryptocurrency was the, the, the global economic crisis of 2008. Right. We saw the global economy collapse. And, you know, for crypto, we had a group of people come together and said they wanted to, they wanted to create a cashless payment system, a payment system that would actually solve for some of the problems that led to the economic shift. So I always like to before we actually shift the conversation to crypto, start with some of the basics. You know, I, I always like to tell people, you know, that they in simple terms, because I think that's one thing we fail to do with crypto is that blockchain is just technology that securely verifies information. It facilitates the exchange of value with our third parties. And that blockchain and cryptocurrency go hand in hand. When you think about Bitcoin and ETH and you know, XRP, 
these are cryptocurrencies and I tell people to think of them like the bright light that's shining. And we know that the light bulb is powered by electricity, just as these wonderful cryptocurrencies we know are powered by blockchain technology. And we know we can do so much more with electricity other than light, and we can do so much more with blockchain other than cryptocurrency. What are your thoughts? I know, I know crypto is not your space, but at the end of the day, you know, the blockchain space is, is rooted in an economic mindset. So what are your pretty broad thoughts on that sector? Well, I, I love your, your metaphor or your, 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 the symbolism of, of, the, of the light and the, the network. And yes, blockchain is, is the electricity. It's the network. And, and, and one aspect is how it impacts currency. You know, there's no question that the, the, current, uh, the current currency situation fails us. Uh, this, the, you know, a central bank like the, 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 the Fed, the Federal Reserve in the United States, that's privately owned and based totally on, on interest. Uh, and it's ridiculous, you know, it's, it's, it's a terrible system. There's no question about it. It needs to change. And, and blockchain gives us that, uh, that method for making the changes. And, you know, I think if we look at, at the current cryptocurrencies that are out there today, we can say that it's in its infancy. You know, that people, people will complain and say, well, it's, it's made mistakes, it's pure speculation and so on and so forth. A lot of that is true, but everything goes through an infancy. You know, if you think back to when we first started using computers, I mean, I was alive then, you may not have been, <laughs> but- I was. <laughs> You know, this huge, huge, we had a whole room when I was an economic hitman. We had a room that's as big as my house filled with these spinning wheels, the idea of machines. And now my telephone has more memory than those machines did, you know? And when we started using the internet, we, we didn't know what we were doing, you know? And now, so, so I think the, the whole currency business is going through that situation. And, you know, I, I like to think, uh, Clay, of, of how, where does the word buck come from? You know, buck, a dollar, a buck. Yeah. It comes from back in the days of, of the, the early Americans, or when, when they called colon, the early colonists, rather. Uh, they had a piece of paper that when a, when a hunter shot a deer, a buck, uh, oh. he, he could give it to a blacksmith. Here, here's a deer for you to have for your dinner. And the blacksmith would give him back a piece of paper that said, this is, this is the value of one buck. Oh, and wow. then the guy, and then the guy who shot the deer didn't have to get his horse reshoed, but he but it would say, you know, you can you can get you can get four horses completely reshoed for the value of this paper. Oh and so, my God. so the hunter could then take that and he could go, uh, you know, to the to the grist mill and buy and buy a whole lot of wheat and grain and give that piece of paper to the guy on the grist mill who owned horses who could take it to the blacksmith shop. So it was just, and there was no interest involved. There was no, you know, there was, and so. The whole idea of currency is just to perform that, that basic function. And, and blockchain gives us an incredible opportunity to do that in a way that has, has integrity and, and, uh, and uh, it does away with a lot of the problems that we currently have in our currency system. Yeah, and, and I love to hear you talk about the origins of the buck because our economy, our currency, you know, regardless of what country you're at, you know, th there's a history of whatever fiat you're using. And certainly in the U.S., you know, we have this, you know, this, this history of, you know, the U.S. dollar. And, and so, you know, some people are threatened by crypto because they feel it, you know, that there's a threat to our financial system. And, you know, I, I say no, because I think, as you talked about, there's an evolution. And, and cryptocurrency is in, in, it's in infancy, as you mentioned. But there's also this thing happening. You know, we, all, we often hear about the, industri the fourth industrial revolution that's driven by technology. And it is this fusion of, you know, blockchain, cryptocurrency, augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics you know, 5G, you know, all of these dynamic currencies are changing the way we live, the way we interact, and the way we exchange value. And, you know, as we move towards this new, you know, innovation economy, you know, I tell people all the time who have issues with blockchain that, you know, the more inclusive money is, however you define money, the better it is, right? Because as we go back to what we just, what I just shared, 1.7 billion people across the world do not have access to basic financial services and you know i'm in this space because cryptocurrency offers them an opportunity to participate now i do want to go back a little bit to talk about 
your, you know, your, your interactions with central banks, one of the conversations that's happened is, you know, this thing about, you know, central banks creating digital currencies, right? So not necessarily a crypto, but some type of digital currency. And in the US, we saw with COVID and the, how the government struggled to send people their stimulus checks, right? Yeah, because they're still sending them paper checks. And then there's so many barriers for, especially people, marginalized people, people who are economically disadvantaged in terms of cashing those checks, in terms of the fees for those checks. And even, you know, so, so we heard that, you know, central banks creating, you know, digital currencies could actually be a step towards moving, that, moving, moving forward. And even for cryptocurrency, one of the use cases has been around remittances. We know that globally, certainly in the US, the diaspora, whether you're from Latin America, the Caribbean, or even you know, from the continent of Africa, you're sending money back home, you're sending billions back home, but you're getting charged a lot of fees. And then, so your relatives are not getting the amount that you sent them, and then they have to pay fees as well. So there's a lot of problems to fix. So as we look towards where the economy is shifting, you know, to a more digital economy, what are your thoughts in terms of how do we make sure we don't, you know, we don't do the step, we don't follow the missteps that we, we had in the past, right? Because it's possible we can create another capitalist society that takes advantage of its most vulnerable. So what would you say are some of the things we can do as we enter the fourth industrial revolution and we digitize, you know, money and value? How do we ensure we don't actually revert back to the problems that we were trying to solve. Sorry well, for that long. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a huge question. And, yeah. and, and I think, you know, we can expect, if we look at history, that, that people in power are going to try to take over the system. Uh, that's yeah. just the way <laughs> it seems to happen. Uh, and actually, we're seeing that happen very strongly right now. We're seeing that, you know, in a way, um, this upcoming election is, is about that to a very large degree. That, yes. But in this particular case, of course, uh, both parties uh, are, are dependent on getting tremendous amounts of money from big corporations, from the people in power. So they both are beholden to power. But we are seeing also this, this I think m more than ever before in my lifetime, we're seeing a real difference in the way these two candidates are, approach the world and approach life. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I think it's important for us to listen to that very carefully and then see where we go from here. So to guard against this kind of thing happening again, I think people need to be very, very aware and we need to be very involved. You know, democracy is, is about being involved. It's not just about casting a vote. Um, I remember uh, Van Jones, who was one of my heroes and, and a friend who worked for, for, for uh, yeah. uh, President Obama for a while and was yeah. a very big supporter of, of President Obama. And, he, and he, he said, you know, the shame of the thing is that President Obama got elected and it was, it, 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 that's not the shame, it's good he got elected. <laughs> The thing is that people were very involved in getting him elected. There were these rallies that almost looked like revival meetings, you know, very supercharged. Once he got elected, people kind of sat back and said, okay, our man's in now. Now we can relax. We don't have to do anything. Obama can do it. When they can't, President, you know, we, we, we need to support these, these, these leaders that, that are trying to protect us. Yeah. I, I'm often, I, I think of historically at the end of World War II, uh, Frank, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, met with a group of uh, leaders of the auto unions, and as they, as they left the, the as they as they left as they left the White House, he was shaking hands with him. He said, "I think you understand now that I'm on your side, but now you've got to go out and get the rank and file to force me to do what you know I want to do, because I have to be forced. The Congress has to be forced. We have to be forced, and I think it's very very important for people to understand that." that we have to force these things to happen. Programs like this are extremely important in getting the message out. And also, we all can, we've got social networking circles, so all of us can push for these things. So I would encourage everybody that's listening to this, you know, get on, go out to all your social networking circles and, and tell them about this and tell them the, the, about the importance of guarding against the misuse of blockchain, yeah. misuse of cryptocurrencies, 
and, and ask them to spread that word to all of their social networking circles. We have an opportunity now to get this out. It's terribly important for the message to get out to, to, to people and for people to really to take action. Uh, you know, the, the subtitle of my latest book, Touching the Jaguar, is Transforming Fear into Action to Change Your Life in the World. And when we have this fear, of things, and, and we should be fearful. We should be fearful that, that, that the system will, tr that, that, that those in power will try to usurp the system. Yes. But once we have that fear, that should drive us to take actions, not to run away, not to be paralyzed, but to say, well, well what, what am I to really fear? And, and, and how can I, what actions can I personally take? Who can I talk to? Because all of us have the power to talk to our neighbors. And with social networking, we have, that power has been magnified hugely. I, yeah. you, know, I, you know, I get like, I don't know, I've got a, a lot of friends. I think it's 50,000 now on Facebook. You know? <laughs> That's a lot of friends. <laughs> that is a lot of friends. <laughs> good thing they don't really know me, you know? I mean, they might not be such good friends. But, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is I can reach those people even yeah. if I don't, even if I'm not about to have coffee with them. <laughs> yes. No, that is the wonderful thing about the digital age, right? We can connect with our networks, even if we've actually never physically connected with them. And I love what you just said in terms of, you know, power seeks more power. And, and I know for some of us in the, you know, blockchain space, there has been concern about who's manipulating the price of Bitcoin or, you know, who's getting into cryptocurrency and, and, and how we're shifting, well, if we're shifting away from the original idea, we know that in 2008, a group of people led by somebody named Satoshi Nakamoto wanted to create a cashless payment system to, to actually empower people. And today, you know, the, the price of Bitcoin is over $10,000. But even though I would say, you know, sadly that Bitcoin is not doing what it was intended, but it's an example of, of, a, of a use case that can actually succeed within crypto. So I do think I agree with you. I do think that, you know, for those of us in the blockchain space, we have to be cognizant and we have to make sure, you know, these principles that we care about, you know, taking, you know, control from central powers and empowering communities and ensuring that people have financial freedom and, you know, and, and celebrating some of the applications of blockchain, you know, identity management, you know, intellectual property rights, all things that empower an individual to actually participate in the marketplace, create their own products and be able to be financially independent. Right. Yes, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there with the Bitcoin thing. It's, it's become extremely speculative. There's no question. And, but it, 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 that's what's happened. But, that, but again, it's, it's an infancy. It's, it's an example. Yes. You, know, that, 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 you mentioned the, the electricity and the light bulb. Well, the, the first light bulbs didn't work very well. You know, ever since... <laughs> light bulb and I, I think it I think it stayed on for a matter of seconds I don't know exactly how long it was but it wasn't very long you know <laughs> and, and then we've been progressing now we've got light bulbs that's, that last a lifetime and they, and they don't use nearly as much electricity things things progress you know that uh, the right bar the plane I, I threw, flew a couple of hundred yards I think and then it crashed basically <laughs> now, we, now you know but now we get airplanes that'll that'll break the speed of, of sound so Bitcoin is, is one of the pioneering efforts yeah. and regardless of whether it works or doesn't work or is good or is bad or whatever goes along with it, it should not be used as an example of what the blockchain can do because it's just one example. It's like, like I love your electricity example. Again, electricity <laughs> can, can make a lot of mistakes. It can burn people. It can shock people. It can make <laughs> but it can also do a lot of really good things. Exactly, exactly. I love this conversation, especially because, you know, at the end of the day, money rules so much, value impacts so many aspects of our life, and it has really dictated a lot of aspects of our society. And I'm glad to see somebody like you who was up close and personal and actually participated in some of the problems. And we're, we're recognizing that we can actually change this and really being a voice and, and, and calling this out. And I think, you know, your book, again, you know, selling over 2 million copies was a testament to your integrity and your, you know, your need to actually get the word out and make sure people understand. So as we close, you know, any final thoughts, anything you'd like to share for, with the audience? 
Yes, thank you. I, 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 you know, I think that we should all recognize that we are very blessed to be alive right now because we are going through a huge transition. This is a, there have been a lot of transitions in history, but this is a huge, huge one. And I think people around the planet are waking up to the fact we, we live on a very tiny space station, the Earth, and we humans are the pilots. And we've been piloting very poorly. You know, we've, yeah. been, we've been driving it toward disaster. We need to reboot the navigation system and we need to rethink, we need to repilot, re we need to become better pilots. And we're alive at this time. And, and I just really encourage everybody to have the, uh, have the incredible hope to know that you're blessed to be alive at this time and there's things you can all do. And in, in, in the book, Touching the Jaguar, I talk about how we can do a daily practice that takes us into what each one of us can do. And I think the important thing is for people to, to really ask themselves, what is it I wanna do for the rest of my life? What's stopping me from doing it? Yes. How can I use it to help other people? What's stopping me from doing that? And, and how do I change my perception so that I can overcome this and really, really have the life I want and, and create the world, help be part of creating the world that, that I and my children and grandchildren or nieces and nephews or whatever uh, will, want to, will want to inherit from me. So we're at blessed, blessed at times and, and I feel blessed also to be on this program with you. It's, it's been really fun. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, no, I've enjoyed this conversation and I love, you know, your call to action, you know, move past fear you know, take action and know that we can actually change our society and change our lives. And so I want to thank you for, you know, joining us for this important conversation. You know, I'm very optimistic, you know, as, as you seem to be, you know, about the future. One of the reasons I am is because we live, the 21st century has four powerful generations, all with, you know, different ideologies pushing forth, trying to solve the problem. So, you know, I know boomers are, to, are, are still trying to solve the problems as a Gen Xer. We're definitely still fighting. And I know the millennials and the Zoomers, they are fighting hard. So I'm confident, as you said, crypto is in, is in its infancy. There's so much that is possible. So thank you. And to our audience, thank you for participating. John and I were thrilled to be with you, to talk to you. And please check out the website, John, you know, it includes a full, uh, full rundown of your bio. So I hope people will check out your books and dare to learn more about the economy. Any parting words? No, yeah, you got it. Johnperkins.org, check it out. Uh, and just thanks again. And I just encourage everyone to take an active role and, and, and have fun in this. Do what, do what, do what draws your heart in, in a way that will help yourself and others make a better world. Uh, let's be part of a big community that we want to make better. And this is an exciting time. Thank you. Well, well said, well said. And to the audience, enjoy the rest of the Black Blockchain Summit. I hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you so much.